Um, hello, everybody. It's Sokyun again. And today, I'm here to talk to you about the work and energy, what they are, how you use them, um, stuff like that. So first, let's get started with the definition of work and energy. Um, so the funny thing is that physicists can't really define what energy and work is definitively. definitively. Um, the definitions are pretty intertwined and it's pretty interesting. So energy is an abil is the ability of an object or thing to do work. Now, it kind of makes sense, right? You need energy, you need to eat for yourself to do work. That's pretty common. But what really we don't know is what exactly is work, right? Um, that's the hard part because work is defined as the energy transfer that occurs when an object is moved. Right. So each the definition of these two things uses them to define itself, which is genuinely hard to understand. Um but for me, I like to break this definition down a bit to a different way. I just see energy as a quantity that an object has and work is basically the usage of energy. Um this is this might seem a bit more abstract but don't really worry about knowing the definitions too much. Um you just need to have a general idea of what these are. Um per se to uh, do problems and stuff like that. Energy is basically something that an object has be because of different forces in the world and work is the work is the usage of energy is how I like to see it. But there's a lot more to this. Um the second thing that we need to talk about is different types of energy before we go to conservation of energies. So there's mainly two types of energies in this world. There's something called mechanical energy, which is what normally we deal with in physics. Um, these include the classic kinetic energy and potential energy. And potential energy. And potential energy and kinetic energy, to know the exact what they are differently, there's a lot more to this that we can go on for oh, quite a bit. There's something called path dependent and path independent forces, and they cause two different at least two energies. But generally, kinetic energy we only use for moving objects. So basically, if a car is moving at a speed of, for example, 60 kilometers per hour, and the car is under kilograms, this motion itself has some sort of energy, and that's normally attributed to kinetic energy. Um, and potential energy is energy that's kind of stored inherently just because an object is located at a specific place. So, for example, if a ball is at the top of the hill, right, what's going to try and happen is that the ball is going to try and roll down, because the law of nature is that objects want to go from high energy to low energy places. So the ball rolling down is, we can explain it as, oh, the ball has a higher potential energy than the lower place. Now, when we roll the ball down, right, the ball rolls down the hill and it speeds up, right? How we describe that as physicists is that, oh, the potential energy of the ball decreased to increase the kinetic energy. And that's what conservation of energy is, is that the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, we know often write potential energy as U, that equals zero. That's what conservation of energy really is. 
there's nothing much to overthink about it. Um, we could we could obviously overthink this and make it more complicated than it has to be, but for the purposes of this exam and just physics one, this is basically it. Um, it can get a lot harder. Um, we because energy you actually have to integrate and use calculus to find them, but you know here we're not really going to do any of that. We're not going to worry about that. Um, potential energies, going back to that, there's a couple of types of potential energies that you'll often see. The first one is gravitational potential energy, often written as GPE. I write them as GPE. Um, gravitational potential energy is quantified by the mass of the object times the gravitational acceleration times the height of the object. Now, height here is a pretty abstract term because you don't know where height equals zero is at. You can say, oh, the sea surface is at zero. Or, oh, the sky's at zero. We really don't know what h the zero is. So this always change. It always differs based on the problem that you want to solve. For example, going back to that hill problem, um, we can say that right there, this height, the bottom of the hill is zero. Then this height we can figure out in terms of that equals zero. So that's what gravitational potential energy is. There's spring potential energy pretty much these are all that you're going to have to see and use so if we have a spring with a spring coefficient k length stretched by distance x we say that this spring has a potential and elastic potential energy of one half kx squared so that's actually elastic potential energy but we only use springs for when i at least took the exam we mostly used springs so I just use spring potential energy, but that's the technical term for it, elastic potential energy. Um, there's also electrostatic potential energy, I think that's what you call it. But I, we aren't really going to cover that here because that's a bit more complicated. We're not really going to deal with ENM yet. Um, if ever, we might in a different series, but ENM is complicated, so we, we're not really going to look at that. These two are the bigger things that you're going to see um, in any sort of problem that you're going to look at. Um, so just memorize these two kind of equations because they are extremely helpful if you can use them right off the bat. Another thing that isn't the conservation of energy is also known as the work energy theorem. But if we think about the definition of work and energy that we defined here, the work energy theorem is actually pretty intuitive, is that the work done is the change in energy, right? Which makes a lot of sense, you know, um, because if you think of energy as a quantity that this object in this situation has, and work is the energy that is used, then this is pretty intuitive. The work energy theorem here is really, really intuitive in that sense. But that's the work energy theorem if you ever see anything like that. The third thing that we need to talk about is power, which is pretty simple. Power is defined as work done over a certain period of time. Um, the work is actually often def the work is often defined as the force that you have done times the distance that the object has moved, which is where this definition, the first definition, is where that's handy in actually defining the quantity of work as force times distance moved. Um, the first definition is pretty helpful, but explaining in the work energy theorem, the second definition that I use often is more helpful in that sense. But that's work. So power, because distance over time is the velocity, can be written as the force done times the velocity of the object, or V average to be, if we want to use that um, precisely. Um, so that's power. It's just work over time. Not too complicated. Um, we love those. and. That's the work energy theorem, conservation of energy. These are the different types of energies that we will often see. Um, 
there's really not much to this unit, or for me personally at least. This is the most important part. Um, it, you, it really requires practice of using this um, theorem, cons the conservation of energy, to solve a lot of problems. You gotta try to do them, um, and that's really gonna help you um, develop skills to do well in this exam. Um, Physics 1 is actually not that concept heavy or math heavy. You just need to know a couple concepts that are really important and basically learn how to bash those out in every situation that you get and you can do well. Um, and conservation of energy, along with the big four that we talked about in the kinematics um, section, is going to be one of the most important theorems that you have to learn in physics ever. So, um, yeah, thank you for listening to this short episode.